We're just gonna let people kind of trickle in for the next few minutes, so welcome. And while we're waiting, if you'd like to use the chat at the bottom and just let us know where, what town you're Zooming in from. Um, we love to know where, where everybody's coming from. And you should have a chat button just at the bottom of your Zoom screen there. Hi, Lydia, welcome back. Great, welcome. We're just gonna give it till probably about 6.33 or so um, to let people come in. Hi Cordelia, hi Gus, welcome. If it does slow down though, we'll get started. So we won't, we won't make everybody wait too long. Well, it looks like it's slowed down a little bit. So as people come in, I'm just gonna go over a few of the basic in Zoom, Zoom rules, which I'm sure you've heard many times over the last couple of years. Um, but just to remind you again, this is a webinar. Um, so that means that the panelists, which at the moment are myself and Tom Danielson, cannot see you or hear you. Um, so if you have any comments, if you could go ahead and use that chat section there. Um, to put in any thoughts you have. If you have a question, we ask that you please, please use the Q&A button, which is also gonna be at the bottom of your screen there. Um, that just helps us keep track of questions a little bit better. We will be answering questions throughout um, the webinar, so please feel free to put them in at any time. And then at the very end of today, um, we're gonna to have a chance, if you're interested, we can, you know, Turn everybody's video and mics on if you want to ask questions that way as well. It's definitely more of a, you know, kind of a, a conversation. Um, and we know that sometimes it's much easier to, to ask your question um, when you're talking as opposed to, to typing it out. Um, so again, if you have any um, or, or technical issues or anything like that, please use the chat for that. Um, but if you have any questions related to the presentation, um, please use the Q&A for that and we will, we will get to those um, kind of as, as we go. If it's a question that seems very pertinent to that time, we'll go ahead and, and interrupt who's ever speaking. Um, if we feel like it's something that could maybe wait a little bit, we will we'll get to that at the end. Um, so with that being said, um, I'd like to welcome you to year three. This is the third year of Stream Explorers. Um, we are very excited to be able to continue this again. Um, very excited to have Tom Danielson of VEP here with us for the third year as well um, as part of this training. Um, so what we're gonna do here, um, oh, I'm sorry, just a couple more things. So we are recording this. Um, so we, the link will be sent out to everybody. So if you have any questions um, or you wanna see it again, you will be able to, to refer back to that. Um, and then just as a reminder, there is a part two of the training tomorrow night um, and you can register through that on our website. I'll also put the link in the chat again. Um, tomorrow night will be recorded as well. So if you can't make that, we totally understand, um, but we'll send that link out to everybody. Um, so uh, first what I would like to do is just introduce us. So I'm Hannah. I work with Maine Audubon. I know I've spoken with, with many of you, especially our returning stream explorers. Uh, so I work in the conservation department and am helping to organize a lot of our community science programs. Um, and then I'm actually gonna hand it over to Tom so he can introduce himself. Yeah, hi, I'm Tom Danielson. I am a biologist and an aquatic ecologist from the Maine Department of Environmental Protection. And um, do, working on the stream explorers is one of my, my favorite parts of my job, so. <laughs> And we're very, very, very lucky <laughs> to have Tom um, organizing this and making a lot of the materials that you're going to be seeing um, soon. So without further ado, um, with the agenda, I'm going to get started and give you just a little bit of an overview of the Stream Explorers program um, and what you'll, you know, what we're asking you to do 
um, and how the program works. And then we're, Tom is gonna go more in depth into the actual methods and what you'll be doing. We'll then be joined um, a little in, in about an hour or so, or maybe a little less uh, by Doug Suter, who is a biologist at DEP, um, the Department of Environmental Protection. Um, and he's going to show us how to use the Survey123 app, which is an online um, data form that you can put all your, your data straight into. Um, he's also going to show us a new map viewer that's been created. Um, and then we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. So let me just go ahead and share my screen. Okay, and if anyone can not see that, um, go ahead and let me know in the chat. But otherwise, I'm just going to get started here. Um, so again, welcome to year three of the Stream Explorers, a uh, main Stream Explorers project. We're really happy to have you here. Um, the goal of Stream Explorers is to recruit, train, and support our volunteers to collect and identify stream macroinvertebrates. Um, so that, that's the, the whole point of what we're doing here. Um, and while we've developed this program, we also want to acknowledge that it's been inspired by a slew of successful volunteer programs that came before us. Um, and so we just want to thank, thank them um, for, for starting and for us being able to kind of model some of our, um, our procedures after them. We, uh, with programs like this, especially ones that take place over a larger geographic area, it's really important to have strong partnerships. And we're very, very lucky um, to work with some great organizations who have helped develop this program. So Maine Audubon is one of the partners, and then the Department of Environmental Protection um, has, is really instrumental in this. Um, and and the, the biggest reason we're able to con you know, continue the program and expand it. Um, we also have Lakes Environmental Association, which is based out of Bridgeton and Portland Water District. Um, so both LEA and PWD have helped tremendously in their time and their expertise. Um, and so we're very grateful to have to ever, everybody on the team. In terms of funding, so this program began in 2020, in 2020 excuse me, with an initial grant from the Maine Outdoor Heritage Fund. And then we've been able to continue it through some additional funding from the Onion Foundation. Uh, we also had some equipment donated and loaned by partnering organizations. So why are you here? Why, why did we ask you to join this project? Well, so DEP, um, and again, I'll, I'm gonna from here on out, re refer to Department of Environmental Protection as DEP. It's a little bit, little bit less of a mouthful for me. Um, so DEP uses aquatic macroinvertebrates as the primary indicator of stream health. And as a, and this is a phrase you'll hear probably a couple times, um, as a canary in the coal mine for troubled waters. So macroinvertebrates are extremely sensitive to temperature, to sediment, pollutants, and other environmental stressors. Um, so really, it's, it's a really good way to see what's going on with the stream. So Stream Explorer volunteers are gonna help by providing screening level macroinvertebrate data for these streams. And then from there, DEP will use that data to target which streams need more follow-up. So um, all, every, all the data that you go out there and collect, that's shared with DEP. And then they're gonna use that to help target and prioritize um, you know, their funding and staff time for more comprehensive surveys. So it really is a big help. Um, and then we know that macroinvertebrates are a really important food source um, for many other aquatic and semi-aquatic species. And they're often the basis for much of the stream food web. So if one or more of those species groups are missing or there's very few insects in a stream, it, the, the rest of the aquatic food web could be affected, which is you know, really an important part of environmental education and it helps um, kind of as the, as the basis for more. So it's really a good way to start to get people involved um, in environmental education. And from there, we know that um, macroinvertebrates can be used as a really effective indicator of the health of our aquatic system. And so a more diverse group of species typically means a healthier stream. And we want healthy streams in Maine. We want, all wanna be able to go out and enjoy 
um, the streams in Maine. We want to be able to, um, you know, protect the healthy streams that are there and then to hopefully, you know, fix the streams that aren't as healthy. So through programs like this, we're hoping that we'll be able to build public support um, to help protect and restore streams that need it. Um, so these are some, just some great pictures of, of some of the sites that folks have been out at. Um, and so there, right now, there, right now <laughs> there are over 5,000 rivers and streams in Maine. So that's a lot. Um, DEP is only able to get out to sample a handful of those every year. So having Stream Explorer volunteers out there helping um, is, is really important. So there's this real, there's this real need for these screening level surveys. We need to, you know, we want to track water quality over time um, and also get information about streams that may have never been surveyed. And we have had volunteers um, last year, especially survey a few streams that had never been surveyed by DEP, which is a pretty cool thing um, because we're getting a lot more information that we wouldn't otherwise have. So in 2020, we initially focused on about you know, 30 to 40 streams in the Sebago Lake watershed. Um, this was a really important area. It provides you know, water to over 200,000 Mainers. Um, south of the watershed hadn't been surveyed recently by DEP in 2020. And then all of our partners are really kind of um, focused around that area. So it can seem like a really great, um, you know, localized area to start with to do our initial project. Um, these streams that we picked in, in 2020, we continue to survey in 2021, and we will also be surveying them in 2022 while expanding the program as well. So this is a um, slide of the, of the sample locations in 2020. So all of those dots there are where our stream explorers um, surveyed. And then you can see that some of those places were also surveyed by DEP. And then this is uh, just a nice little comparison. So 2021, these are where we surveyed in 2021. And you can see that it has expanded outside of, of Sebago Lake. Um, and we did that because when we were, we were able to, we had the resources and we had learned um, and heard from a bunch of volunteers that they were really interested um, in being a stream explorer, but they didn't live near the Sebago Lake watershed. So, you know, one of the most important things about this program, which I, which I mentioned earlier, is environmental education and getting folks out um, to the streams in their area. So we definitely wanted to make sure that people had that choice. Uh, so we opened it up and as you can see, people took full advantage, which is really great to see. Um, you'll, Doug Suter in a little bit, will show you more about this map, but this is just showing again where, where folks are um, surveyed, and then they, you can also see more information about real site, um, each site, which is nice as well. Um, so in 2020, we had 24 volunteers survey 26 streams, and then in 2021, we had over 50 volunteers um, survey over 35 streams. So we saw a really wonderful um, jump in participation, and we're, we're hoping to, um, to go over that this year as well. So how does, how does this work? How do we know that the data that is being submitted is, is something that um, DEP can use? Uh, so we have a lot of quality assurance and quality control measures in place. Um, and each of these you'll, especially the materials, Tom will go over, you know, be able to explain better than I did as he has, has created these wonderful things. Um, but we have a, a guide, we have keys um, and field sheets. So these are the first versions. We have updated them, um, which everyone will have access to. I'll be sharing those um, via email and they'll also be on our website. We do two training webinars. So these are our online webinars, our first one being tonight, our second one being tomorrow, um, and they're always recorded. So they are available to view um, at any time. Uh, if you need a little refresher, it's always, it's always nice to have. And then we also do some in-person workshops. So we'll be doing these in June. Um, these are our June dates. Um, the sign-up information will be available soon. And again, I will email that out to everyone. But basically how it works is for, usually from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. You sign up for an hour and a half slot. 
and then you're able to come to one of these three sites um, and actually practice, uh, practice collecting and practice your identification skills. And we will have um, people from the different partners there to, to help and to, to walk you through the key and things like that. And this has proved to be um, really helpful, not, not only for all of our volunteers, but for us as well. Um, I have learned quite a bit at these two, so they're, they're a lot of fun. Um, so again, more information about that will, will follow. Um, pictures. So we ask Stream Explorers to take photos, um, both of critters that you're not so sure about, um, and then also of ones that you do know, because one, we want to see those, <laughs> um, and two, they're, they're just really cool pictures. Um, so, you know, most people out in the field, um, even if you don't have service, you have your smartphone with you. So if you find a critter that you're not sure what it is, you can snap a picture and then email it to either myself or Tom, um, and we can help with get, make sure that you can get that identified. Um, another really helpful thing with these photos is um, uh, all of our programs are based on grants. And so for our grant reporting, it's really nice to have these images um, to be able to share um, with people who, who give us the grants so that we can show them, you know, what's going on, what are people doing out in the field. Um, so this has been a really, really helpful tool as well. And again, we all really enjoy seeing the photos. We had a wonderful AmeriCorps student last year working with DEP who created quizzes to, to help um, you, you know, practice what's, um, practice your identification skills, and then also learn a little bit more about the macro invertebrates. So these are all linked on our website. Um, and I will, again, we'll share that link via email. But the fun thing is you can challenge your friends, you can set up teams, you can have competitions. Um, so it's another really great tool uh, to, to kind of hone your skill um, and to, to learn a little bit more. Our uh, online survey123 data form. So that's what this is here. Um, and again, it is slightly updated and, and Doug will be sharing that with us. Uh, but this is really nice because you can put your information right in there and then it feeds directly to our map viewer. So you can see where you are serving in relation to everybody else. Um, and this can be done while you're out in the field or when you return to your home and have service. Um, so this has been really helpful. Those of you who don't wanna do it online, that's totally fine as well. We will still have paper data forms um, that you can fill out and just mail into me and we'll get that in there. So um, if, you choose, if you'd rather not do um, online, that's completely fine as well. So after all, all this training um, and you've, you've learned uh, all about macroinvertebrates and you've picked a site um, and your site can either be a stream that you're really interested in, it may be in your backyard, it may be down the road, um, or it may be picked off a list that DEP is, is putting together. So we have an initial list um, from our 2020 and 2021 seasons and then we'll we'll hopefully be adding some more lists this year, or excuse me, some more streams um, this year to that list. So once you've picked your list, again, either one you wanna do that's, that's mean, you know, meaningful to you or is off the DEP list, um, then you need a sampling kit. So we have created these sampling kits that are now at six different locations um, and they really have everything in them that you need to sample. Um, so they're going to have all of the, the guides and the keys that Tom has created, and then they're going to have all of these different materials. Um, we have people who didn't want to wait for a kit to um, be ready to be checked out, so they've put together their own kits. We actually had quite a few volunteers do that last year. Um, most of the things in the kit are readily available and fairly, fairly cheap. Um, except for the net and the um, guide to freshwater invertebrates. Both those are a little bit more pricey, um, but if you have any everything else and you would just like to, to grab a net from us, we can also arrange that. Um, so these are, again, these kits are all kind of put together in a nice little tote and then they're available at uh, these six different locations. Um, don't worry about writing this down now. Again, we'll be available on our website and we'll be emailed out. But as you can see, um, there's you know, a fairly good range. So 
Falmouth, Standish, Bridgeton, Wyndham, Auburn, and then we will be getting a kit up to Edgecombe, um, hopefully within the next two weeks. Um, so that will be available up there as well. And we have a checkout procedure. So you essentially contact the person um, that's associated with that kit and they'll help arrange a time for you to pick it up. And then again, for drop off. So who is here? Who is volunteering? Um, you know, who, who might you be working with? Um, we've had a really wonderful and wide range of people join this program. So everything from, you know, retired science teachers um, to families, you know, we had a child as young as five participate, which was wonderful. Um, college students, fishing buddies, you know, if you're out um, looking for brook trout, you might as well search for a couple macro invertebrates as well and, and get that data in there that we would really appreciate that. Um, and then this year, so 2022, we are also expanding to include uh, school groups, educators, and classrooms. Um, so we will have an additional educator training for stream explorers on May 12th. That will also be a webinar. Um, when I am done with this portion of the presentation, I will link in the chat if you are interested in signing up for that. It'll be more of an abridged version of all of this um, and a little bit more of how this might work in a classroom. Um, but if you are an educator or you know someone who's an educator who might be interested, um, please share the link far and wide. Um, we would love, love to get folks involved. Um, and that will be a little bit more focused on the greater Portland area this year. Um, that's just in terms of where we could get larger kits to. But if you know someone who's up in the county and wants to get involved, um, you know, they can still get in contact and we can see, see how we can help them out. Uh, so these are just some, some more photos of our, our volunteers out in the field um, searching for critters. And then this is some of my, I love getting the, we've got some great drawings and photographs and stories from volunteers were out in the field and we are really appreciate um, all of those things. And it's wonderful to see the creativity of a lot of folks come out. And then again, this is um, just some, some more great photos of what you might be looking for. Um, and, and again, mention that we will be um, expanding again this year, both in geographic area. So um, kind of again, if, if folks are way up north and wanna get involved, we're, we'd love it. Um, and then also including um, our educators in schools as well. Um, and this is just a thank you. So, so a lot of those um, photos were for, by our volunteers um, and also shared by organizations. And then a lot of the images um, were also edited by Tom's daughter. Um, so we wanna thank her as well for, for helping out with that. And finally, so this is, this is how you get involved. So you've done the first step, you're here at the webinar, you've joined the webinar. Um, the next thing to do would be to um, sign up for a, one of the workshops, the in-person workshop slots, if you're interested. Again, that is not a requirement, um, but if you're interested, we would love to have you. Um, and then figure out where you wanna sample. So again, is that is that someplace in your town or is that someplace that DEP has said, yeah, we will me um, and I can help you find a place and you're going to use that link up top or my email there, conserve at Maine Audubon. Um, and I will send all of this out to everyone as well. Um, so you're going to sample and then you're going to input your data into survey one, two, three, or mail me your paper data form. Um, and then we will say a big, big thank you because um, you've helped um, us and you've helped DEP and you've helped mainstreams um, to kind of figure out what's going on. So with that being said, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. And it looks like Doug's there. Hi, Doug. <laughs> um, if you just wanna quickly, we're gonna actually pass it over to Tom, but if you wanna quickly introduce yourself, that would be great. Sure, uh, Doug Suter, also with Maine DEP. And I'll be showing you the, uh, how the app works after Tom's done. Um, all right, Tom, so I think we're going to pass it over to you. All right. Um, well, 
let me know when it pops up. It's there, perfect. Okay, great. Well, uh, welcome everybody. I'm so happy to have a uh, year three of Stream Explorers and it's um, exciting to see lots of folks online. Um, so I'm gonna talk about, sorry. There we go. Um, so tonight um, I'll talk about the instructional materials, uh, how to collect samples and how to sort the macroinvertebrates. And then uh, tomorrow night, we'll talk a lot more about the what aquatic macroinvertebrates are and an overview of the types that you'll be seeing in main streams during the Stream Explorers program. So uh, macroinvertebrates are animals that do not have backbones that you can see without magnification. And so this is uh, some macroinvertebrates in a healthy stream. And without even knowing what they are, you can see that there's a, a lot of different kinds in a healthy stream. So there's a lot of diversity. And the ones in blue are ones that are th uh, generally sensitive to pollution. They need cold, clean water. And then the ones with the green are ones that are little, they still need really good water quality, but they're a little more tolerant to disturbance. And, um, and then if you had a stream that was not very healthy, it might look like this, where the sensitive macroinvertebrates can't live there anymore because of maybe it could be salt in the water or bad habitat. To the water might be too warm, and uh, but you still have some of the more like intermediate tolerance, the ones in green. Uh, but the communities really shifted over to these tolerant organisms, such as um, these little fly larvae called midges and amphipods, which are these like little shrimp-like fellows. And, but you can see compared to the previous uh, slide, there's a lot of diversity and not much diversity. And so the purpose of the Stream Explorers is to help main DP um, and get more information about the water quality around the state. As Hannah mentioned, the DEP can only monitor a certain number of streams a year doing a very detailed comprehensive surveys, but uh, the volunteers can cover a lot of sites and they can then provide information that would help the department prioritize where to go to look at nice healthy streams or ones that might need help. Um, and so the Stream Explorers has these guides, keys and field sheets and so the, this year, we have three uh, volumes to the Stream Explorers. There's an introduction in sampling instructions. Volume two is a basic macroinvertebrate guide. So folks who are return, uh, have done Stream Explorers in the past will notice that we, the, we have a simplified macroinvertebrate guide. And then we have uh, what was the, regular guide is now called the expanded macroinvertebrate guide. But we're finding that the uh, some folks were struggling with uh, so many choices and learning that many macroinvertebrates. And we thought it would be easier to start with a more basic macroinvertebrate guide, and then people can uh, work their way up to the expanded one. And each of the uh, guides has these taxa, taxa keys that will help you uh, decide what type of macroinvertebrates you have in your tray, in your sample. And so the, the basic guide only has two pages now as opposed to six pages in the expanded guide. And so there's uh, this page and then there's a second page where the first page were animals that had uh, jointed legs and, and this second page are animals that do not have jointed legs. And so we'll talk a lot about all of these macroinvertebrates tomorrow, but I just wanted to show what the what materials we have for you to, to uh, learn. And then when you uh, get to a certain um, critter on the, the key, then uh, each of them has a page similar to this, where it has pictures of the organisms. It says if it's a sensitive, a intermediate or somewhat sensitive, or tolerant organism. And it has pictures of the different types that would be in that group, 
uh, gets into the diagnostic characteristics, behavior, environmental sensitivity, and then down at the bottom, you'll have uh, these little scale bars showing what sizes they may be um, out in real world. So you can see that, that a lot of these macrovertebrates will, um, they're not all the same size. They can, as they are young, they'll be smaller. And as they mature, they'll get bigger. And then we have these uh, paper field sheets for keeping track of what types of macroinvertebrates you're finding. And uh, Doug Suter, who has been very kind to work on the survey one, two, three forms so they can be entered electronically. So you have your choice. You can do paper in the field. Uh, you could do the survey one, two, three on your uh, tablet or your phone in the field, or you could do the paper and bring it home and then enter the stuff on to the survey one, two, three on your, your phone, tablet, or computer at home afterward. So there's lots of options for folks. So the in the first volume of the guide is the introduction and sampling instructions, and it gets into you know, what type of place you would ideally like to sample. And uh, so as Hannah mentioned, uh, this slide says that project coordinators will give you directions to, to a sample location. Uh, this is an older slide. I need to update that. Um, you, there are some sites that uh, Hannah has a list of where if you don't know where to go, we can help find a site for you. Um, but you're not restricted to those either. You can go to any stream you want. And usually the sample team would have two or more people uh, just for, it makes it easier to sample and it's more fun to have someone out there with you. And as Hannah mentioned, you can have a, up to six locations now to sign out a kit of sampling equipment. And you have these various items in the kit. And then when you are at the stream, there are a couple target habitats that would be good to sample. And, and in order of preference, the best areas would be areas where you have rocks on the bottom of the stream with several inches of water flowing over the rocks. It, the next best option would be an area where the water has carved out and eroded a little area under the bank. So you have what's called an undercut bank. And sometimes you'll have tree roots and stuff there. So the different macroinvertebrates will often hang on to those tree roots and find that as a good place to, to live. The next habitat would be logs and branches that are submerged underwater and in several inches of flowing water. And then the last target habitat would be where you have plants growing in the water. And so when you approach a site, you would look for those types of habitats and you would target at least four samples in the highest priority habitat type. And then if you want, you could allocate one or two samples to another target habitat in the stream. It, it's perfectly fine to do all six samples in the highest priority habitat. Um, it's really flexible. So here's an example of a stream that uh, is up in the China area. And in this stream, there's a lot of rocky, you can't really see, but in the bottom of the stream, there's a lot of rocks and it's a lot, and there is a good flow nice gentle flow, but it's a constant continuous flow. There's also some overhanging alder bushes with roots in the water. So in this stream, I might do four samples where the rocks are, and then two samples where the overhanging alder bushes are. So for the rock samples, you have the net, and typically it's easiest if you have one person hold the net, and then the second person would squat down and um, would kind of have an imaginary box in front of the net. 
about 18 inches in front. And you would pick up a rock and uh, wash off the material and have the, the, uh, the stuff float into the net. And so the, the, you want to have the net facing where the water is flowing into it. And so uh, you would uh, pick up a rock and hold it near the front and kind of be like a raccoon and gently wash the critters off of the rock with your hands. And the, the, all that stuff will then float into the net. While you're doing this, you might want to just keep an eye for things that are trying to crawl back out of the net. Sometimes, in particular, uh, these stoneflies, which we'll talk about more tomorrow, uh, they will often try to crawl out of the net, but um, you should just push them back in. And so you would uh, pick up a rock, clean it, and then set it to the side. Pick up another rock, clean it, set it to the side. And this could take you know three to five minutes of doing that. And then uh, afterward, if it's not too sandy, you could just kind of agitate the substrate under the rocks. Ideally, uh, it's easiest to process the samples later and to find the bugs if you don't have a lot of sand. Um, so if it's a sandy stream, then I might avoid uh, that last step of agitating underneath the rocks. For the root samples, you do something similar where you hold the net where the water is flowing into the net. And in this case, you would um, hold the opening of the net right where the, the tree roots are and the branches are. In this case, these alder uh, trees will have uh, twigs and, and also some roots coming off of it. And so you can hold the net there and then the other person would go in and gently agitate the and wipe off the, the, you know, the bark and the roots and try to have stuff float into the net. The uh, branches, so in this case, this is a sample where, uh, where you have these submerged branches and logs. So pretty much the same idea. You hold the net where the water is flowing into it, and then you have the second person like wipe the surface of the branches and logs and have things then float into the net. And for the, for the rocks, typically, the rock surveys, you typically will leave the net in one place and just have you work in front of it. For the roots and the, the branches, you, you might have to move the net while the other person is cleaning it so it just so things um, are floating into the net. So you so you have to kind of work with your teammate. And then finally, if the fourth target habitat were these plant samples. So this is where there are these emergent uh, grasses, sedges, rushes, or pickerelweed, or in this case, you got a burried. Uh, you could, same idea as the other ones, you just uh, would have one person hold the net and uh, the other person would gently wipe and rub the, the plant surfaces to get stuff to float into the net. And again, in this type of situation, you might have the person with the net, you know, move as to follow more closely where the person is cleaning to try to maximize the amount of critters that are captured by the net. So in general, uh, you want to do have six samples per site, and you'd have these three trays, so these white trays, or some or Sometimes there might be different color, but you have these three plastic trays. And in general, you'd have two samples in uh, each tray. And so you would do, you do your first two sample, you do your first sample, empty it out into the tray uh, where that works best, where you have some water in the tray already. And then you would uh, turn the net inside out and then uh, have it dip into the water to help get the stuff um, that was inside of that out into the tray of water. And then you'd go collect your second sample that would go into tray number one also. 
And then samples three and four would go into tray number two, and samples five and six would go into tray number three. And so spreading out the samples into the three trays will make it much easier to, to first see the macroinvertebrates and then to pick them out and identify them. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the less sediment or sand you have, the easier it will be for you to um, see the macroinvertebrates. A lot of these macroinvertebrates are designed to not be seen, and some of them are quite small. So once you have them in a tray of water, you would generally want to uh, let it just sit for a little, little while, and you would want to just watch it and just stare at this tray, and, it, and you'll start seeing things moving. And the longer, the more experience you have in doing this, the, you'll just see more and more and more. <laughs> so it's a little harder at your first time out uh, because you'll, there'll be things that you are, you'll be surprised that they're that small or that you'll be surprised that they, that's a bug because it doesn't look like one. Um, but it gets easier every time you do it. It also helps if you're new to try to go with someone who has some more experience. And if you are interested in going with someone who's more experienced, you could contact Hannah and she might be able to, to match you up with somebody. So uh, once you have the macroinvertebrates in a tray, we have the spoons, brushes, and the pipettes to help remove them from the tray and into these uh, other holding places. And uh, sometimes it's helpful to use the brush and the spoon together. So, you, so if you use just the spoon, when you sometimes when you pull the spoon out of the water, as, as you're pulling it out, the water is coming out and the critter might also flow out of the spoon. And, but sometimes you can use the brush to help kind of put it, push it into the spoon and then to help keep it in the spoon as you take it out of the water. And then once you have it out of the water, we have these Petri dishes or ice cube trays and you fill, fill those a little bit of water and then you, can, um, you can put the invertebrates into those either ice cube dishes, ice cube trays or Petri dishes and uh, match them up with similar kinds that make it easier to count them later. Um, so plan on, if you can, it probably an, like an hour or more. Um, it, you could, it's amazing how fast it can take uh, or how fast time goes by while you're doing this because it's quite fun. And once you start looking at the critters, it, it's, it, it's enjoyable and you can spend a lot of time looking for them and then identifying them. So you might want to plan for about an hour or more um, if you're really fast and you're in a hurry, you could probably get it done in 45 minutes, um, but you could also easily spend two hours, <laughs> depending on how much fun you're having. Um, but anyways, uh, once you have the critters into the Petri dishes and ice cube trays, you can use your keys and guide to identify macroinvertebrates. I'm pretty sure each of the, the kits will have a laminated keys, so they'll be able to get wet and not get damaged. And so those are really helpful. Um, and then you can enter an abundance code for each kind. So once you match out, you've gone through the key and you think you know what you have, then you would have this abundance code on the field sheet or on the survey one, two, three form of a few common or abundant. If you are, um, if you would like to count them and actually put a number in, then that would be great too. And also if you are a teacher and you uh, want to do some activities with your kids later on, it could be very helpful for the kids to count them um, and have numbers. And then you could do some fun things like make bar graphs of the different kinds of organisms and compare sites. And it, it just makes it uh, more interesting for the kids. And it's a sneaky way to teach them uh, to help let them practice their math skills. And then uh, once you have counted uh, the different kinds, uh, I'm sorry, the, the numbers of 
individuals in each kind, then you would count the number of kinds by their sensitivity group. So you would have on the field sheet, there's a spot where you can say the number of different kinds of sensitive macroinvertebrates, um, and then the number of different kinds of moderately sensitive, and the number of different kinds of tolerant macroinvertebrates. And those uh, can be very helpful when trying to get a quick overview of the condition of the stream. Uh, and I'm going to just back up to the first uh, up here. So this is the basic field sheet. And so if you were pretty sure you had a mayfly, or then you would you would type in the the uh, the abundance category there. So if you had like six to twenty five mayflies, it would be a C for common. And then you could even put in the number there. And then you would do that for each of the types of critters that you have in your sample. And then uh, on the front of the field sheet, uh, these are the ones that are sensitive to pollution. And then on the back of the field sheet, uh, these organisms here are moderately sensitive. And then we have a group of tolerant organisms. And so in addition to putting an abundance value for each of the ones you find, then you would count up, um, all right, I got, you know, three different, if you had a mayfly, stoneflies, and caddisflies, then maybe you'd put in a three here for sensitive. And maybe you had two of these, so you'd put a two over there for tolerant. And, and so again, this it would provide us a very good information about the health of the stream. So for this healthy stream, we had some nice uh, sensitive organisms and there's a nice diversity of them. And there's a, another a nice diversity of the green ones that are the moderately sensitive. And there's also some tolerant ones. Even healthy streams will have tolerant organisms. The tolerant, tolerant organisms aren't bad, they're just tough. So if they, but if you had a stream and you visited and you didn't have any sensitive organisms and you had mostly tolerant ones, then that would be a sign of potentially that it's not very healthy. And so both of those types of situations can be helpful information to provide to Maine Audubon, our partnering organizations and to Maine DEP. And then Maine DEP could follow up with, if it's a really nice stream and DEP has never been there before, then it might be a, a very good to document that. Um, as a very nice stream and with the DEP's methods also. And if it's if you, if the volunteers are finding something like this, then that might be a site where the department might want to go back and to confirm if it's healthy or not. And so that's part, that's it for my section. And so I'll stop sharing my screen. Or maybe a uh, Hannah, are there any questions? Yes, yeah, we do have a couple questions. Okay. Um, let's see here. So um, we've got one question. So how was it established? Um, how do we know which macroinvertebrates are sensitive to water quality and which aren't? Yeah. So the the uh, there's a lot of information about uh, some groups like mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies. They're they're commonly viewed as being sensitive to uh, pollution and needing cold, clean water. And uh, so some of these ones here in blue. And uh, But I also took the step of going through the uh, main DEP's like long history of biological monitoring that goes back to 1983 and uh, went and saw uh, what are the organisms that we found most often in the healthy streams based on our surveys. And um, so, you know, for the, in the basic field sheet, the, these ones here were ones that were most often found in the nice quality rivers and streams based on the DEP sampling. And this, this coincides, if you went to other parts of, the, of this country, it'd be the same groups primarily. And um, similarly, the ones that can, are tough 
and that can survive and even like an urban stream that has a lot of salt and it's warm and it doesn't have a lot of um, good habitat. The ones that are the toughest are these ones here on the bottom. And uh, so the, the, so I selected representative critters that we're, we are found in Maine to be in high quality streams or the ones the, the, the last ones to hang on in the bad streams as food tolerant and so forth. So um, so the especially the expanded guide is really tailored to Maine. Um, we have another question here. If the stream may dry up in the summer, would you still want it sampled? I'm assuming before it, before it dries up. Yeah, so um, sure. Uh, so um, the department primarily samples in the summer, but with the Stream Explorers program, you would have the option to pretty much sample when you want. And you can find shifts in the different kinds of macroinvertebrates depending on the time of year. Uh, but in general, if you're in a nice stream, you will find sensitive organisms in the spring, summer, or fall. The one tricky thing about streams that dry up in the summer is that sometimes those streams um, may not have as abundant, uh, um, they might not, the macroinvertebrates may not be as abundant in those than in a stream where they're wet all year round. So if you went in the spring and sampled them, you just might have to, um, you be really careful when you're sorting through your trays or even collecting a double sample just to try to get enough critters to, to you know, make it worthwhile. Um, and then kind of just, just off of that, I'm gonna jump to this question because it relates a little bit. Um, does this sampling apply only to streams or are vernal pools also a part of the program? Yeah, so uh, this, this guide is designed for streams. And if there is interest in the future, I was, uh, I was thinking of doing a similar guide for uh, ponds. So like, um, and that would probably work for vernal pools too. Um, but it's a, there, there are the, the uh, what you would find in a, like a marsh or a pond or a vernal pool you might find some of the same critters, but there's really a, a shift in the, where you'd find a, some critters and streams and not in, the, in a pond. And there'd be and vice versa. You'd find some things in a pond that may not be in a stream. Um, I should also mention that if you are sampling areas like underneath uh, the roots on the stream bank or like an area on the side of the stream where there's plants, you could get some things that you might find normally find in a pond. And so uh, don't be surprised if you find in your tray, there are things that aren't on the, this guide, uh, aren't on this uh, field sheet or aren't in the guide. Um, so uh, those are still really cool, fun uh, critters. And if you, and you can learn more about them. And if you're not sure what they are, you can take a picture and you can send me a picture and I could help you let you know what they are. And um, I believe uh, the Vauxhall Guide to Macroinvertebrates, the book, is that in the kits? Yes, it is. Yeah, so some of those pond critters would be in that book for sure. And uh, so don't be surprised if you find things that aren't in the guide or on these field sheets, um, but uh, you can just make a note of them, and, but they won't count uh, for the Stream Explorers Stream Edition. Um, we have quite a few questions here. I'm just going to do one more before we pass it over to Doug, and then we will get to, to the rest of these questions. Like I will um, type the answer to some of them, and then any that I don't, we'll get to at the end. Um, but Hillary is asking, what is the frequency of sampling each stream? Uh, yep, so it's up to the volunteers. Uh, so uh, for most streams, it'll be once a year. Um, if you are really interested in the stream, um, it might be interesting to go out more than once to see, you can start seeing some seasonal shifts and it's really, that's really fun to learn about that too. So, so we find that the, uh, one of the uh, really fun aspects of Stream Explorers is not just that it provides information, but it's really just a, um, uh, it can be 
an enrichment experience for everybody who's interested in the outdoors. And, and the more you look, the more you learn, the more you appreciate, and the more questions you have, and it just it kind of can get out of control. <laughs> Um, and I think I can't remember if that this was on your slide or not, but we do ask folks to commit um, to to between one and three streams over the season so that, you know, between May and October, um, if we would love it, if you could get out to one or three streams, that could be three different streams if you want to do three or it could be the same stream three times. Um, but we are we are looking at that. And I also wanted to mention that uh, if you I don't know if the questions are about the critters, but um, tomorrow's night talk will we'll get into the critters a great deal and i'll try to look at the questions that we can't get to tonight to try to answer them tomorrow um, while do, doing that presentation great thanks tom that was wonderful um so i'm going to have you stop sharing your screen perfect and then we are going to pass it over to doug who is going to show you the survey one two three app and how you would get that on your computer or tablet all right let's see so while I'm figuring this out, I should mention in my introduction, I left out that I am a, a Maine Audubon chapter board member for Mary Meeting Audubon. So. <laughs> Want to share the screen? Voila, mainstream explorers. So yeah, so this is mostly going to be based on how to get the electronic app onto either your phone, your tablet, or your laptop. Like Tom mentioned, you can go out in the field using the phone or tablet, or you can write it down on the paper and you can bring it back in and enter it all in on your computer. Or you can enter it once you get home on any of these devices. So if you're using a phone or tablet, it's pretty simple. Android has one way. You go through the Google Play Store and you just search. So first thing you want to do is probably load the Survey123 app onto the phones or computers before getting any further. So like I said, with the Android, go ahead and the Google Play Store with an Apple-based iPad or iPhone, you go to the App Store and search for Survey123 for ArcGIS install that. Uh, if Well, we'll come back to this. So once it's installed, it'll bring you to this screen, which we'll show you again in just a moment. So if you're working with a computer, you're going to have to use Google to kind of find the app. So you'll search for the app, get survey123 and Google will bring you to this page here. So there's going to be three possible options. So don't do these ones with the red X. <laughs> avoid those. So for the computer, if you have an, a MacBook or a Apple Tower, you go to the App Store. If you're Microsoft-based, you hit this bottom link below, and this will go ahead and install the Field app for you. And this is still with the computer, so you'll get to the Field app. It'll bring Get Survey 123. Like I said, this is that center section that we're showing the file will download onto your computer into your downloads then you'll have to go to your download folder double click on the thing and it will install for you so once you have these apps you'll uh you could hannah's going to send this out so you can aim your phone tablet at this goofy looking thing and it'll bring you to our app or you can just click on the link here and this is on your computer, you'll probably just shoot the link here. You click the link and this will open up the tablet or this will open it up on your computer. Sorry, this is the tablet of the phone. And it'll pop open here. So looking at it as if you're on a computer, you'll get this little option here. So open in a browser or open in the field app. So it will work in either of these. If you open in the browser, it just won't look as good. It's got some weird HTML features about it that show up funny in the browser, but look good in the app. And I guess I'm not smart enough to figure out how to get it to code better <laughs> so that it looks good in the browser and the app, but maybe we'll figure that out. But try it in the app. That's what I recommend. So once you click on that app, 
that link, say I open it in the app, it'll pop this little window open, says open an ArcGIS survey one, two, three. You could collect this, select this button. If you hit this little checkbox here before, you'll never have to see this again. It'll just automatically open. And then looking at, it'll kind of bring you to this screen. So you'll, you can sign in. If you have an account with ArcGIS online, they do offer free accounts. You can sign in, but you don't need to. You can continue without signing in. And I recommend that. It's probably the easiest way of doing things. And then you're off to go. So I'm going to bring it over here. So this, so I've clicked on the app. So I want to open it in the field app. So here we are with the open and field app. Open survey one, two, three. And that link that we showed you before will bring you to the Stream Explorers app. Come on now. Come on. All right. So because I've already logged in, it didn't show me that open without the account screen. So, so this is how it opens up in the app. So we have your location is the start. So you're going to decide whether you're going to use the basic or the advanced survey first. And Tom, a quick question for you. So or tonight, are we just covering the basic or? Um, you could do primarily. I, if you could do the basic. I want to show both. but Yeah. But um, if you have time to do both, that'd be awesome. Yeah. Let me go just quickly show the advanced, and then we'll come back to the basic. Well, no, sorry. All right, never mind. So we're going basic first. <laughs> so you pick your base. So we're going to do the basic here. So you put in your stream name. So you have, so these little stars, these are mandatory. You can't submit your data without having filled these out. By clicking either the basic or advance, it will determine what options show up further in the survey. So you put in your stream name, your town, you just click the down button, select a town. You have to put in the date. You have to click on it to get it to show up. Date and a time. And then say you're, uh, if you're using the tablet in the field, it will auto populate to where you are. But if you've collected your data while you're out and about and you wanna come back to your office or back to your home to put in where you sampled, you just kind of zoom in on the map where you think you were, you're somewhere near Sebec. You say okay, and this will populate. It'll put the pin on the map, populate your coordinates, and then we were suggesting you take an upstream and a downstream photo. And we've put in the option to select up to eight photographs. So if you've got a funny looking critter that you can't quite identify, feel free to try and take a picture through a the best picture you can get of it. If you want to take additional photos of the site, go ahead and take pictures if you i'll show you in a moment here but if you want to write down the numbers of species in addition to abundance codes you could take a picture of your notes so you're allowed up to eight photos so all you have to do to add a new photo is hit this little additional photo yes button and then it gets to eight and you're done so from your computer so if you're again sorry i should mention this so using your tablet, you click on the little photo button. If you're home at the computer and you've already taken the pictures on your phone and you put them onto your computer, you hit this little folder and it lets you navigate to the folder where your photos are, are contained. And then it just associates it with the app and it uploads them. So you describe, moving on, you describe the sample location. You can put in the name of the collectors here. Your minutes at the stream, again, mandatory so we were in a hurry so we did it 45 minutes well we sorted for 45 minutes we played around in the stream for an hour and a half two hours because it was fun <laughs> we sampled two rocks two trees you didn't mention logs but logs count too was this the well never mind yeah and plants as well which you kind of handle as as a tree root. So you got carried away. You sampled more than you needed to sample, but you're having fun. So it's okay in this case. Tom will 
correct you later. <laughs> so this is the basic. It opens up. Your, here are your sensitive species. So the basic form, it has everything open. So we have our mayflies. We had a good collection of mayflies. We had a few stoneflies. It was a nice sight. Quite a few caddis flies. So you just go through and you select your abundance code for each of these. And while you're going along, it keeps track of how many you saw. Yeah, had a single water snipe fly crawling around, but a whole bunch of these free living caddis flies. Oh, that's unrealistic. A good, a good few. <laughs> then it keeps going down to the moderately sensitives. I didn't see any of those. There are tons of these things as usual. They're fun. Dragonflies, you had a few of those. They're fun. Got to have a damsel fly because they're cool. Black flies, oh, it's mean. <laughs> so yeah, so you keep cruising through this thing. It gives you a couple examples of beetles and the beetle larvae, but there'll be some different looking ones as well. The water pennies that Tom will talk more about the beetles and such tomorrow. Crayfish, one of them bit you. Paid attention to him. He snuck up while you were playing around with the rocks. And this was a pretty nice sight. You had maybe a stale or two, which is interesting. But, so then once you get to the end of this thing, so it's kept track of this for you. So we're going to go ahead and I'm going to submit. Well, we're going to come back to this. But, so the, once you get to the end of the survey, you'll hit this check button here, and it will submit your survey for you. So you can send it now, send it later. So if you want to, it's like, well, I wasn't entirely sure what that was. If you took a photo of it, you're going to ID it later. You can hit send later. It'll send later. It will save it on your computer or your tablet. And you can come back and correct your ID if you want or something of the sort. So, but we're going to, I'm going to hit continue for just a second. So I can go back up and show you the advanced here, but we're going to come back and submit this data in a moment. So doing the same with advanced. So what advanced does, if you click the advanced tablet, advanced tab, go through the same stuff until you hit the location. Now the, uh, the boxes are closed. So there's just a few more species. So this is where Tom will get into this a little more tomorrow with the different species. So this is where your IDs have, your ID skills have to be a little higher level. So you're gonna work your way into these probably for the most part. So you pick the different species and it's the same principle. You just go through them, select them and it keeps track, expand the boxes. And the tolerant species are actually the same for both. But... So we're gonna go ahead and submit that basic form. So we would hit the submit. So I didn't change anything with the advanced one. So we're gonna give it a stream name too. So, so it's got our, what we recorded for these. Oh, no, we lost them. Oh, well, sorry. Yeah, by clicking the advanced tab, I lost what I put in before. <laughs> One leech. Yeah, scary. Coming to get you. So we're going to send it now, and off it goes. So that data has now been sent off to the cloud. These are our different apps. So going back to our PowerPoint here, hopefully you're now seeing my PowerPoint again. <laughs> so this is the map. So the map should now populate live. So here's the link to our map. We click on this thing and it opens up, which I need to refresh the map to see this point that I just entered. And here we are. Here's our new Sebec point. So here's our Sebec stream that we just entered. So this it gives you your listing of sensitive types, moderate types, tolerant types. So this is the ArcGIS online project that's open and available for everybody to look at, to view. You can play around with this quite a bit. There's nothing you can do to break it. So Feel free to play with it as much as you like. So it has a number of options. So basically I start with the layers over here. 
So it's showing last year's data as well as this year's data. If you want to see something, you go over to the, you hit this little layer button to see different layers and you poke it in the eye if you want to turn it off or you want to turn it back on, you poke them in the eye, which is a weird way of doing it, but <laughs> <laughs> that's what they came up with. So. so we're going to look at some of these layers. So like the sensitive, so it's kind of mapped now. So I have sensitive and moderately tolerant species minus the tolerance species is kind of how it's showing. So the bigger the purple dot, the more sensitive and tolerant species are, the bigger the orange dot, the more, more tolerant species there were. So you can filter on these data. So if you, so you've clicked on your layer over here, I'm going to poke the other ones in the eyeball, I'll turn them off. So we're just looking at this one. So we have this thing on. So we're going to, there's all these different tools you could play with. You could start, and this is where Hannah will send out some additional instructions so teachers will be able to work with their classes to do, you can even do some plotting and graphs in this, in this project now. So, but we'll set up a filter first. So say you just want to see, we want to build an expression. I just want to see what I entered this year, what I entered last year. So I'm going to go to stream name and I'm going to replace that. You have, oops, sorry. Do so you have all these different options of the data that's collected? You want to see that, but we're going to go down to the names of the people. So the names of the collectors. So I want to build something that says anything where I've been out and about. Oop. Dumped it. So I'm going to put in a couple of them. So these are the sites I went out and did last summer. Oh, come on, Doug. <laughs> oh, come on. This arc map embarrasses you every chance it gets. <laughs> <sighs> All right, sorry. So yeah, so you could get lost doing this quite easily, but like I said, there's nothing you can break and it has a lot of options that you can play with. So right now I'm showing any site that I went to. Hey, Doug. Yes, Tom. So could you, um, if you were interested in a certain uh, type, uh, like Stonefly, you could put it that exactly. in and see where it is? Yep. That's cool. Yep. Yeah, so yeah, you just change this to whatever you want. So if you want to see just where aquatic dance fly was found, or if somebody at DEP is interested in kind of coming around to try and sample sites where they, where we find a more sensitive species or sites where we have a particularly tolerant species where we want to know, or even crayfish, say we want to find rock, rusty crayfish. And this would be a good way for us to start looking for, well, there's crayfish found at these different sites. And we know rusty or tend to be in sites that are well, they're in pretty nice sites, so wouldn't work that way, but <laughs> yep. So you can play with it that way. They have pop-up boxes. So once you brought it up, you can bring the site to where you were. You can see this site had seven sensitive, nine moderately tolerant, moderately sensitive. And oh, we got to change that terminology. Two tolerant. You could page down, see the photos. Like at this site, we were collecting the actual number of species. So I took a photo of my... Uh, my note sheet, keeping track of everything. Page through them, see different pictures of the sites. You get the stream photos in here that you click on, you get, this is a nice site. Uh oh, go back. <laughs> it's hidden by the Zoom screen. So yeah, so like I said, play with the map as much as you want. There's nothing you can really do to break it. Once you've built your expressions, you cancel them and you get back to the original data. Pokemon eyeball again, you can see the other things. So the newer sites, one more thing. Yeah, so the new sites, we're gonna show up under the Stream Explorers 2022 ones. 
So we'll have a uh, we'll have a form just for the advanced, what's submitted under advanced, and what is submitted under basic under the basic forms. And under last year's data, I kind of pre-built this thing. It'll show you. I built in just places where the larger the dot, the more species were found. So where the tolerant species were found, where there were some sensitive species found. Again, the larger the dot, the more there were, and the moderately sensitives. So it gives you quite a quite an option to play with the data and see where everything showed up. That's really about that. Like I said, you can't break it, so feel free to, if you shut it down with a filter on or something like that, that's just fine. But I think you've just issued a challenge. People are going to try to. <laughs> So the one thing you can't get pop-ups on these. So most of them you click on them. So you gotta have the layer on in order to see the data for it. So once you turn the data on, it'll give you the pop-ups with the photos and so on and so forth. So I think that's about all I've got to say, unless Hannah has something to remind me to add <laughs> no this is great this is really exciting right. um to have this this is a wonderful so people can see um how do I where everybody share? surveying oh do yes. you just uh, <laughs> need some help to, to stop sharing yeah all it says is new share i don't want a new share nope there we go <laughs> all right um we have just two of the same questions so people are saying they've downloaded the app they got there and now what's the step to get to the actual stream explorers so that um, there was a link and this link is going to be available both on our website and in um, documents that I send out to you. So there will be an actual link and then there will also be a QR code, which is that funny little black and white design thing. Um, if you're on your smartphone, you can use um, your photo, your camera to take it to uh, use the Get to the QR code, which will take you to the um, Stream Explorers page, or you can click from your browser the link, and that will take you there. So um, I'm going to put that. I'm just going to put that link um, in the Q and A there. But then again, that will be on our website, and it will also be um, sent out yeah. to everybody as well. Mul we'll make sure you get it on mul multiple ways. Um, let's see here. Yeah, so pop it into the chat. So, oh, perfect. Thank you, Doug. Here's the oh, can you? Oh, I sent it directly to you. Yeah. <laughs> can you do one more uh, time to everybody? Yes. <laughs> um, so Doug is putting the link straight in the chat there. And then, um, what I am also going to do right now is add two more links. So, we've got um, the link to register for tomorrow night's training. Um, so that's part two of this one where Tom is going to deep dive into the, the critters you're looking for. Um, and then there's also going to be a link to the educator um, webinar, which is on May 12th. Um, and again, please feel free uh, to share that with any educators um, that might be interested. Let's see here. Okay, so you've got those two links. Um, in the chat as well. So with that being said, um, we, that's kind of the, the end of our first night. Um, if there are folks that have questions, we have a couple options now. You are welcome to put them into the Q&A. You're also welcome if you want, um, there's the option of raising your hand on a webinar and I can actually unmute you um, and you're welcome to ask a question or, or anything that way as well. Um, we'll have more opportunities, of course, to ask questions tomorrow. Um, and if I remember correctly from last year, I think the questions, um, there are quite a few bit, few more questions than nights that we went over the critters, um, because there are a lot of them. Um, and I know Tom said this at one point, but, but just to emphasize as well, some of these are quite small, and, and we know that, um, and they can be hard to find. This is why we, we have definitely labeled this a treasure hunt. Um, so don't worry if, if some of these, you know, you're, you're not quite getting them at the beginning with practice and a little bit of time, time you'll get there and, um, you'll start seeing, you'll look and be like, there's nothing in here. There's nothing in my water. Nothing's happening. And then as you look, things start moving. 
um, and then you'll start seeing more things moving. So, so you will get there. Um, it just takes takes a little bit of practice, and we are um, available throughout the season to help as well. Um, there's a question if, if the recording for uh, tomorrow's session will be sent to everyone, and yes. Um, so tonight's recording, as well as tomorrow night's recording, will be on the website um, uh, probably first thing next week, and then we will also email it out to everyone. Um, as well as a lot of the, the documentation that we've talked about and the different materials so that will go out to everybody. Um, Tom, yes. Uh, one other thing is I forgot to mention, um, my daughter was helping make a, a video of, uh, of me collecting stuff in the field. And so hopefully that will be posted up on the website eventually too. It's uh, hard to get a teenager to finish something sometimes. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, that would be great. Doug, can you just pop also the link to the um, map viewer in the chat as well? Oh, I just did. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, it should be there. Yeah. You double check that. Yes, you did. I see yep. it there. Yep. Perfect. Great. Yeah, the QR uh, code would not go through. The Zoom chat doesn't quite um, support that, would be my guess. Yeah. But that link did work. The pre the earlier link will bring you to the same thing as the QR code. Yeah, perfect. Um, so are there if there are no other questions, um, and again, if you think of something afterwards or there isn't is there something um, we haven't covered or you need some clarification on, please feel free to reach out. Um, my email address is um, I'm gonna. Well, I'm just gonna pop that in the chat as well. If you have any questions, please feel free to to send an email um, to conserve at mainaudubon.org. Um, any questions? Feel free to reach out, and then we will hopefully see everybody back here tomorrow night. But um, I want to say thank you so much to everyone who joined us um, on this. You know spring evening um and we will see you tomorrow and thank you to, to, to tom and doug as well for all of your work and thank you and all of your help getting ready for this thank you for coordinating <laughs> all right everybody have a great night <laughs>